Goedenavond bij Topneem, zoals elke dinsdagavond om 9 uur vanuit Freedom Lab. Ik zit hier alleen vanavond zonder mijn vaste maatje Erwin Blom. Die vond het nodig om zomaar drie weken op vakantie naar Thailand te gaan. Uh, hij moet zijn laatste vakantiedagen, denk ik, van Topneems nog, uh, nog opmaken. Het is hem gegund, Erwin. Veel plezier daar. Uh, we hebben straks halverwege de uitzending nog wat vragen die hij heeft ingestuurd. Ik zit hier alleen, maar ook weer niet... Alleen, want we hebben gelukkig een hele leuke gast vanavond. Uh, Svet Baslikov, if I pronounce it right. Yeah, completely. Okay, from a company called AMP, a startup based in Amsterdam. Yeah. What do you do? So we provide remote monitoring uh, for renewable energy installations in Africa. Um, it sounds pretty niche. Renewable energy yeah. installations. So solar mostly. Solar. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, it sounds pretty niche and it is a bit niche. We mostly work with businesses. But mm -hmm. Uh, we provide what I think is a very valuable service for them. So let's f first explain yeah. me what it is, because yeah. we know what solar panels yeah. are, yeah. and yeah. you need a, 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 to convert that those, that energy to mm -hmm. use it. But what is a monitoring system for mm -hmm. this kind of off-grid installations? What what is it? Sure. Yeah. So when you want to install some systems. Yeah. Um, you uh, and very often so having we're talking about systems that are off grid that are in places that have no power so very often you're here in remote places yeah um, and if you're the installer or the operator of these systems you want to know what's happening with them um, and communications and other digital technologies these days allow us to get information from them and operate them at a distance without going these places. Yeah. So the remote monitoring system, it's a little bit like, um, if you take the grid in Europe, you know, you've got power stations, you've got these big control rooms with, yeah. uh, where you know, people are sitting and looking at what's happening on the grid in different places and all of this stuff. Um, we provide uh, software that's similar to that in some respect, but for uh, companies that operate uh, remote off-grid installations. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, like the, uh, so you can monitor the health of your system exactly. uh, uh, from distance. Uh, uh, explain me a little bit uh, why this uh, niche market is so interesting to you. I yeah. mean, I've, I've lived in Africa for a while. Uh, there are large, huge areas without any grid, yeah. without electricity yeah. or, or cable uh, phone uh, systems. Uh, is it the same like uh, as we have seen with the mobile uh, installations that people actually skip a whole phase and uh, that for, uh, I mean, if we talk about electricity, uh, the, 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 the big companies uh, make the conscious choice to make like smaller off-grid installations mm -hmm. instead of putting all those cables in the ground. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. that's one of the fundamental drivers of, of what's happening there. And I don't know to what extent the audience is familiar with, 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 with the problems there, but you have, you know, a lot of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have 90% of people who don't have access to electricity, mostly in rural areas. Yeah. So, um, and, and the ones that do have access have very unreliable access in many cases, but that's yeah. kind of a whole different story. Uh, so instead of um, actually building centralized grids uh, in these places, what a lot of companies and smaller entrepreneurs are doing are actually building uh, decentralized energy infrastructure. Uh, smaller systems, sometimes it's systems that just power a single house or a single factory. Sometimes they have a grid and they power a village or a community. So we call these mini grids. Um, so yeah, to, to go back to the analogy that you made with, with the, the, the mobile telephones, I think there is a very good analogy. You have, um, instead of you know, building telephone, cables everywhere. You can just put a few masts here and there and then everything connects yep. wirelessly. Yep. And now we have a picture where instead of building a whole electricity grid that's all connected and expensive, especially to reach you know, really far, far away remote places, uh, you can actually build distributed generation and just build the, uh, the solar panels, for example, and the batteries where the actual consumption is. Yep. Um, and, and, and as I said, yeah, there's a few trends. Yeah, but then, in the then world. you say you, you basically work for other businesses who uh, want to invest in this kind of systems. What, yeah. what are the problems you solve for them? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the time it is, it is operational uh, problems. So to do with real-time operations. You know, I made the analogy with how somebody, you know, in, in Amsterdam maybe is monitoring what the grid in the, in the Netherlands is doing. Uh, what we enable our uh, customers, the companies that we work with, 
to do is get a, a real-time overview of all the installations they have in different places. And this can be pretty complex. I mean, you've, you've got solar panels most of the time. Often you have batteries. Uh, sometimes you have a diesel generator. Sometimes you have another grid connection. And sometimes you have a bunch of customers that are connected. So we, we help them get all of that information from all of their sites across their whole portfolio. And this could be hundreds of sites across countries. Um, and, and get a, a, an instant understanding of whether everything's working well, whether there are any technical issues that they need to be solving anywhere, whether all of their customers, so the, the end users of the power, are getting reliable electrical supply, or whether they need to send a technician out. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a very basic service that we provide. Uh, but on top of that, I mean, once you have these data streams coming and you can process them and analyze them and get uh, insights from them, what you're able to do is, is just add a lot of value on top of that. So we can help with things like longer term planning. We can say, hey, you know, you installed 50 systems that looked like this. Um, did, you, did you install the right components? Was the sizing right? You know, for the next 50 systems that you install, should it be something different? Um, you know, we, we obviously live in a world that's full of data these days, and um, there's just the power of what we can do with, with the volumes of data that we can collect from these machines is, is really tremendous. Yeah. Um, I can imagine, uh, I mean, it's, it's really a, a B2B uh, mm -hmm. service you are uh, offering. Uh, uh, if you look at, at, at the trends, do you really see that more and more uh, people and companies become interested in installing this kind of mini grid systems in, in rural Africa? I mean, from my own experience, I know that 10 years ago or 15 years ago when I lived in Zambia, uh, the, uh, people were already making businesses of solar mm -hmm. panels. I mean, they would install one panel, have one car battery and charge their neighbors for yeah. charging their phone. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, but, but is this interest growing and growing? Is it yeah. an interesting market? Yeah. Well, from what we've seen, yes. I mean, th again, think about the trend here. We're going from a world where energy generation was done in big power plants that would cost you know, millions or billions of, to, yeah. to, to build to a situation where you know, a system can be you know, $50. I mean, we don't necessarily work with the ones that are that small, but you, know, you can spend a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars and have something that supplies your house uh, with electricity. Yep. Uh, so you do get these local entrepreneurs that can, you know, without a huge amount of capital, uh, but with a knowledge of the market and an ability to, you know, some technical knowledge about how to install these things, go, go and do that. Um, and as you said, not just for themselves, but they go and provide these services to other, other people or other businesses or so forth. So in many countries, you know, across the markets that we work in, which are mostly in Africa, um, you do, you, there is a real proliferation of companies that are taking on this business um, and either providing power to, to people and businesses that never had it before, or providing better power to, uh, to those who have a really unreliable connection to the existing grids. Now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for, for, why did you start doing this? I mean, uh, uh, when I was researching, I saw you were working actually for one of the biggest German mm -hmm. energy providers, E.ON, it's called, uh, w when you started this startup with, with three people. I mean, it's, it sounds like quite a change in, in focus. Why did you start it? In some respects. I mean, I guess the story, for me personally, at least starts a little bit before E.ON. Um, I, so I was doing already some, some work in Africa, although it was in a sort of educational context uh, in Ghana. And at the same time, I was in my day job. Um, I was a management consultant, and I was doing some work on smart grids in the mm -hmm. U.S., uh, and looking at the kinds of tens of billions of dollars that were being invested in trying to make the existing grids in, in places like the U.S. smarter. Um, and then looking at, you know, many places across Africa and saying, well, there's, there's just no grid here. So if you were to build a grid from the ground up, how would you, you know, that's, that's a very exciting, that's a very exciting problem to work on. So I was in a place where I was looking for my kind of next challenge, and that was... Uh, yeah, that was what I decided it would be. It, it, this, this big problem of energy access, of clean and reliable energy access for people who don't yep. have it, 
uh, and, a, and a huge yeah, but, but you have a tec- you have a technical background yeah. Uh, yeah. but 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 somehow you made a choice to for an idealistic uh, approach it's idealistic but it's also it was also a very interesting technical challenge and yeah. you know I, i i i love to i wanted to apply uh, my skill set, which I wasn't quite sure what that is, but <laughs> I wanted to apply it to something that yeah. felt like a really big and important problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and after having kind of looked, you know, on the fund of the, the fundamentals of different problems, I kind of figured that this is, this is a, a, a really exciting one to go for. Um, so that took me to a couple of, uh, a couple of different um, kind of professional directions and, and I did end up at Eon as you said although I wasn't working for uh, I think what people mostly recognize is, is Eon the utility yep. we actually had a, a smaller unit within that which is called Eon Offgrid Solutions which was a unit that was set up by Eon to explore energy provision so innovative energy provision in emerging markets um, and and I wasn't one of the the founders there but I, I did join reasonably early on in, in its existence and we were basically building mini grids in Tanzania okay. um, and it was it was incredibly exciting I mean, we were basically uh, going to places that had no power we were installing state of the art technology not in terms of it being very expensive or hard to get but in terms of the kind of the digital capabilities that it had and the, and the smart capabilities that it had so we would install smart meters we had mobile money payments so people can you know uh, send us you know punch in a code into their phone and you know their light would come on yeah uh, everything was completely renewable uh, yeah. fully kind it, of are, are that powered. also the kind of services that you are providing to people who use your your technology because I mean, there are a few things I can imagine if you have a mini grid or mm. an off grid installation in Africa, billing. Yeah. I mean, people, the, the end user has to pay for the services, uh, uh, that kind of stuff, monitoring, what happens if they don't pay, how do you uh, cut them off, yeah, yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Is that what you are offering too? Yeah. Well, yeah. we, so Eon, Eon was the birth, or Eon off grid, yeah. right? It was the birth, birth story of what is now yeah. AMP. So we, there we developed the software platform, yeah. um, which we then subsequently spun out into AMP, yeah. the startup that we're now running. And it's interesting that you mentioned that at the start, AMP was in a way the, the platform that ran everything. It, it included It included the billing element. It included a lot of the kind of smart meter yeah. controls and things like that. Yeah. Um, we, when we did the spin-off, we had kind of had to put our thinking caps on a little bit and say, "Hey, look, we're going to be a really small company with with little resource. Like, where, what are the markets? What are the services that we can really pursue here?" Yeah. And we decided that actually, probably the most scalable thing we can do is is just look at the sort of technical monitoring of these grids and, the, and the, the data and analytics that we can do based on that. So we made a conscious choice fairly early on to, you know, at least for the time being, set aside the customer management and the billing and things like that. Um, because when we looked at who our potential customers were, you know, the people who would use this software, we actually realized that they, you know, they're working in different places geographically, but, but also they have different approaches. And then it's still a young market. People are experimenting with the different ways you can provide the service. And as a software company, it was going to be difficult. It was going to be a lot of customization for yep. each individual use case. Yeah, because I can imagine you have to work with a lot of different systems, yeah. different payment systems, exactly, yeah. integrating with solar panel uh, producers to diesel generators, uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, is that part of the, the complication that's in, in, in the network, in yeah. the service you provide? So we, yeah, so, so, so we decided to kind of pick our battles in that yeah, respect. Right. So at the moment, we indeed integrate with many different hardware manufacturers, both uh, solar panels, inverters, batteries, diesel generators, you know, all the relevant things that people want to monitor in smart yep. metering. Um, and, and yeah, we made the conscious choice to, to not go and integrate with all the different um, the payment providers, all the different kind of customer management functionalities and, yeah. and things like that. Okay, you, you already mentioned, and it's also uh, stated on your website, that you uh, mainly say you're a data and analytics mm. company. Um, um, how do you see that? I mean, what kind of data do you actually collect from the systems uh, you, you, you monitor? And mm. uh, how do you use it? For what purpose? Yeah. Maybe actually to, to, to start with the data analytics part, that is in some respect the core of where we work. 
Um, but it's probably worth saying that there is um, a whole kind of value chain around that. I mean, actually collecting the data. There's a there's quite a quite a significant IoT element, so Internet mm -hmm. of Things, where you know yep. things are getting connected, and yep. and we do actually work and the communications that allows it. And we actually do a lot of that other stuff as well. But you're right. At the end of the day, what comes out of this of the physical systems that we work with uh, is a data stream, and we where we have the most value is in terms of being able to wrangle that data stream uh, to, to unify the different bits of data that we get and to make sense of it so that we can uh, work with our customers to improve their operations. Uh, so, for example, to send them an alert whenever something isn't right. But mm -hmm. to be able to look at all the data that we've collected uh, or our, all the data that's coming in at that given point and say, oh, yeah, there's an anomaly here, like, you know, your batteries being damaged or, you know, yep. your, your solar panels are dirty uh, yep. and you need to send somebody to clean them, that kind of thing. And the way that we can do that, and this is not a, a, a new story, right? I mean, you hear about machine learning and, and artificial intelligence and uh, all, the, all the really fancy things we, we can do. And it's, yeah, it, it, it is really interesting to think about uh, how the the services that we provide can become smarter and smarter mm. as time goes on, as we're able to look at these data streams that, that are coming out. And is, uh, is that also on an on. aggregational uh, uh, level? Because that's, that's what I'm also interested in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can imagine for an individual client of you, he wants to know if the system is working, the, the capacity of the battery, uh, what you say, if you have to clean the yeah. solar panels or whatever. But all those customers together on, on the aggregation level, what is the kind of data you are looking at and what, yeah. what can you do with it? Yeah. Well, is I mean, there value in it and for who? There is, I mean, one, the one thing we do is we do, you know, we do separate our customers' data okay. from, from one another and it's, it's quite highly protected. So we're never going to say, hey, you know, we're seeing that our, this other customer is experiencing this, like, what do you think about that? Or um, we've got fairly strict rules around doing, mm -hmm. doing of a course. lot of, yeah. um, well, yeah, releasing anything that, that our customers would, want, would not want to be released. Um, but there is a lot of um, interesting insight to be, to, to be gathered nonetheless, where, you know, for some of our customers, they have lots of different systems operating in very different ways uh, across the board. And they can, based on our data and our insights, get an understanding of, for example, what is an efficient way over the long term to operate a system? What is an efficient and a cost-effective way to build a system? Uh, what kind of com components should you be using here or there? Um, and yeah, fundamentally, how do you how do you turn your business into a better business uh, that allows you to serve your serve your customers better down the line? Yep. By understanding your yeah. operations and by understanding the implications of all the decisions that you've made. Uh, all right, uh, um, my friend and colleague who is always here, Erwin Blom, he's, he's in uh, Bangkok at the moment. I saw mm -hmm. uh, on your website that you're actually attending a conference in Bangkok yeah. uh, and that you're also aiming now at Asia, uh, Southern America, uh, different parts of the world. So you're yeah. a really international company. Uh, and Erwin sent in a, uh, his question about this subject. You understand Dutch, so I'm not going to translate it, but uh, let's have a look at this question. Sure. Stekel een berichtje uit Bangkok. Ik ben vandaag aangekomen. Helaas de komende drie weken niet actief bij het topneems, maar wel lekker op vakantie. Uh, het is hier uh, warm, het is hier lekker warm. Uh, Bangkok is een lekker chaotische stad. Het is hier een rommeltje. Dat zijn heel vrolijke mensen en uh, dat is fijn. Nog fijner wordt het straks als ik naar de eilanden ga, maar daar uh, bericht ik zeker de komende weken over. Nu een, uh, een vraag aan Emp. Zoals afgesproken uh, stuur ik iedere week vragen op voor de gasten. Vraag aan Emp. Kijk ik op de website van Emp, dan zie ik dat ze zeer internationaal zijn. Hè? Europa, Amerika, uh, Afrika en ook Azië, daar duiken ze op. Uh, bijvoorbeeld uh, in april zijn ze hier in Bangkok voor een uh, congres. Mijn vraag, waar zitten de verschillen, waar zitten de overeenkomsten als je tussen de werelddelen vergelijkt? Waarin is Azië of waarin is Afrika anders dan Europa of Amerika? 
That's a tough question, I think. <laughs> it's very deep. And okay, I, I give think, it a try. I think people have written books about this stuff and continue to try and tackle, yeah. tackle these kinds now, of things. We always questions. discuss with, with startups who are at this table <laughs> when they want to make the move from Holland to mm. Germany that it's a big yeah. step, you know, yeah. because of the cultural differences. Yeah. So yeah. I think he's aiming, you know, at this. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So the, the, yeah, the, the, the similarities and the differences between the different places uh, that we work in. In some respect, it's, it's easy to say what the similarities are. Um, I mean, we, you know, in our work, we get exposed to some fairly kind of basic needs that, that people, people have. And, and the need for electricity is something that, um, well, let's say most of us take for granted. I'm sure everybody yeah, looking absolutely. at this, yeah. uh, this show is... Uh, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't really think about, we've all grown up knowing that I can, I can walk up to my light switch and I'll press it and the lights are going to turn on. <clears throat> That's not, I don't really think twice about that. Um, and across, across the world, there are many people who don't experience that, right? Um, and... And so that's, the same, that's the same all over the place. But what yeah. we always hear at yeah. this table is that, you know, doing business with people in a different country, I mean, is, yeah. is really complicated if you know, don't know the culture yeah. really well. Yeah. So what is your strategy? Are you going to set up offices in, <laughs> in different parts of, of the world? Or do you say, well, you know, our technology is so simple to implement that it, it's clear to anybody? What, what is your yeah. strategy yeah. in this? Well... So I'd love to. I'd love to say our technology is so simple and clear that it's easy to implement, uh, and that would be one of our hypotheses. But I, I know for a fact that it's often not true. So we are actually setting up um, a physical presence in, in some some of our key markets. So we're actually setting up an office in Nigeria now. Okay. Um, yeah. But really, what we what we try and do to bridge these gaps is to really work with the local entrepreneurs uh, in the local companies and organizations who are making this, this happen. Because there is, at the end of the day, a degree of commonality, a degree of common understanding that we can have with them. And about, is it because you're uh, basically uh, having a B2B uh, service that your strategy is to cooperate, for example, with a hardware vendor of, yeah. of, of, of those systems, you know, who can implement your software on their hardware and in that way sell you a service in that country? Is that your strategy? Yeah, yeah. that's definitely one of the things. Of that, no, definitely yeah. one of the things that we do. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's a, that's a very attractive channel for us because yeah. then we need to do very little work to actually get our solution into the hands of, into the hands of different people and, and have impact yeah. in, in lots of different places. Yeah. Um, but, but also the companies, you know, the companies that are building uh, these renewable energy systems in different places, um, they, they are the ones who have the local expertise, who can deal with uh, the, you know, the end customers, the people who yep. are getting power for the first time, yep. or the local authorities that they need to work with to, yep. to make sure that these things are provided. They can do the import and export of, of equipment. I mean, as you said, doing business in different places is very different. And that was actually, to the question, that was actually one of the things I was going to say. The culture of how things get done in different places is, uh, is certainly very different. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we've, we've felt, uh, you know, quite, quite deeply, I would say. Even the way that people and companies organize themselves to get things done, the way that, uh, you know, sometimes you have smaller units and smaller communities doing things and in some countries, in yeah. some cases. And, and while in others it's more understood that it would be done at a, at a higher level or at, gov at the government level, for example. Yeah. All right. Those are, yeah. Uh, you, you explained you developed the technology when you were working with your two co-founders at E.ON, a German mm -hmm. company. It was a spun out. Mm -hmm. uh, you spun out with, with this technology. Uh, then you ended up in Amsterdam being part of Rockstart. Yeah. How did that happen? Um, well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's one of these things that's probably pretty random. Um, I, at that time... I was actually coming, I was living in the US and I was coming, coming back to Europe to, uh, to work at E.ON uh, and my wife had also got a job here in the Netherlands. So we thought, well, let's, let's move to Amsterdam and you know, I can go to, to Germany occasionally and show up in the office. Um, and then Henrik, one of my co-founders, mentioned, oh, you know, maybe if you want to do this, 
thing as a startup we can we can set up in Amsterdam. And I thought, yeah, yeah. sounds like sounds a good, good idea. Let's do it. Um, and then around that time, we found out that Rockstar, which is a startup accelerator here, has a smart energy program. Yeah. Thought, and they were actually explicitly said they were very interested in emerging markets and mini grids. And we thought, well, that sounds pretty yeah. good. So. We yeah. applied to join them. It was a, and you a were really nice and, fit. And yeah. We so yeah, summer of 2018. We yeah, it's only two years ago, there. two and a half years ago. Uh, one and a half years ago. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 So things actually developed very quickly from yeah. there. Yeah. Um, how did you finance uh, your growth? Do you have investors on board? Uh, how, how does it yeah. work? Well, at the start, it was a lot of not eating and not paying ourselves salaries. Yeah. Um, That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until until you know you can kind of prove that people are people are willing to pay a bit yeah. a bit for for what you have. And actually, uh, this isn't the answer to your question, but one of my main learnings from doing a startup was that for people to go from saying, "Oh, what you're doing is really interested, really interesting," to saying, "Oh, great, I'll pay you money for it." It's actually a much a much larger gap than I think we realized when we started off. Uh, but yeah, so so a few months later, and I'd say with very much also with the help of Rockstart and, and the network there, um, we, we had five people, five angel investors come together um, and we did a, our initial funding round yeah. with them. Uh, so that was actually earlier, so the first quarter of 2019 okay. last year. So just, yeah. a, just under a year ago. Um, and yeah, so that kind of put, put a little, a bit of uh, breath into yeah. the company and we managed to you know, grow a bit, hire, hire some more people and, and, and really continue growing. Um, and, and we're just about to uh, close our next, uh, next funding round now. So we've got uh, some investors that have more or less committed yeah. to doing it. And we're, Already, we're just, we're so just, there's, there's enough interest in, based on the first signs of your markets and yeah. the, well, as you say, the preparedness of people to actually pay for your services yeah. because that's quite a step. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, completely. So we've got things are things are in the final stages of being signed off now, and I think we'll have some okay. really good news okay. uh, in the next in the next few weeks. Um, so it's yeah, it's I mean it's been really fantastic to actually well not just feel the growth. Obviously, every startup wants to grow, yep. but also just to see that there is really increasing momentum and recognition for the markets that that we're serving, and and a lot of belief even from more mainstream investors who may not be that familiar with. Africa, or, or even with energy, in some cases, who say, you yeah. know, this is really, this is really a fast-growing, high-potential market that we want to that we want yeah. to be present in. Yeah. Um, last question, because we always say we have half an hour, and amazingly, that always goes very fast. <laughs> I mean, um, um, so basically, two more questions, maybe. Um, I mean, you're looking at Africa and other areas where there's no electricity. I'm, me, myself, I'm actually very enthusiastic about the possibilities of going off-grid or the mini-grid installations. And I see really a trend developing that people also in Europe yeah. or Norway or, or the Netherlands becoming more and more interested in small-scale energy production. Is that something you are also looking at? Yeah. One of the questions that people, and this is actually a question that investors often ask me is, you know, yeah. why are you guys in Africa? Why don't you just go yeah. to Europe and serve people there? Yeah. And my answer is, well, we will. But actually the most exciting stuff now is happening in Africa and, and in other emerging markets where there's just so, so much like white India space. like India and wherever. Yeah, yeah. Southeast yeah. Asia, also South yeah. America. There's just so much white space, so much need for these solutions and so many people going and building them. That that's where the growth is currently. There is a lot of there is a lot of growth, and I think will be even more growth in, in distributed generation and distributed consumption of electricity in Europe as well. And as you say, people going off grid. And I think we're you know we're very well positioned to serve those markets as well. Hmm. Uh, but at the moment, our learnings uh, and, and the real progress I feel is coming from Africa. And Europe is actually going to lag behind yep. emerging markets when it comes to these solutions in many ways. Okay, if I would invite you again uh, after a year to come back. What am I going to tell you? What are you going to tell me? How many people do you have in your office? You have six now. Uh, yeah. How many turnover you have? How many yeah. countries you serve? Yeah. Well, what I is think, your ambition? I think, yeah, I think we're closer to 10 at this point. I think yeah. a year from now we'll probably be seven, 17. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, as a startup, it's always hard to pin things down on, on turnover or yeah. things like, because those are almost some, just not the metrics, but we want to be 
you know, we want to be present across, um, uh, you know, across a number of these markets and have at least a few thousand systems that we're, that we're operating. At the moment, we have about 500 systems, which is already, you know, uh, quite, quite a strong scale for, you know, given, yep. given our age and given the size of the market, really. Uh, but yeah, we measure our success in, in terms of how many customers we're helping and how, you know, what the scale of their operations is. So we want to have, you know, 20 or 30 customers with, uh, with at least three or 4,000 systems. That three or 4,000 systems. Yeah. So uh, any idea how many end users will use electricity uh, that that yeah, I mean, mo multiply systems. the systems by anywhere from five to five hundred, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, it, my mental math is so it's good. basically an endless uh, yeah. market. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, it's it's about it, this, it's about the scale of impact, and that's really what we're what we're striving yeah. for at this well. point. Okay. Well, I wish you all the success in the world. I mean, it's, uh, it's an interesting enterprise you're uh, heading for. Thank yeah. you. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you. Uh, dank jullie wel voor het kijken. Uh, dit was aflevering uh, 1384, ongeveer hè, in ons tiende jaar. We vieren dit jaar ons tienjarig jubileum, ergens in juni. Uh, daar horen jullie ongetwijfeld nog meer van de komende tijd. Deze uitzending zit er weer op. Uh, ik moet onze sponsoren altijd bedanken aan het einde. Dat is Freedom Lab natuurlijk, waar we hier elke week weer gastvrij ontvangen worden. Dat is Bier Co. die de biertjes heeft geleverd, al drink ik vanavond gewoon een glaasje lijn. Uh, PKR verzorgt de hosting van onze website, al doet dat bedrijf nog veel meer op het gebied van allerlei IT-services. En we hebben Jetstream, die uh, al zolang wij bestaan ongeveer ook de livestreaming verzorgt bij ons op de website. Dank voor het kijken en tot volgende week. Dag.